tell my experiences, which will not rock you back in your chairs the way some of the combat veteran stories do, because I spent most of my time in the service of about four years in the training command, where nothing very exciting ever happens. But it was still a necessary part of things. I uh, graduated from high school about uh, six months after Pearl Harbor. Uh, it was very difficult to keep an eye on college because everybody was going in. All my buddies were gone. By December 9, 1942, I enlisted, only to discover that uh, the pipeline was so full of enlistees at that point, as well as the people coming in through the draft, they couldn't put everybody on active duty. And I got sent back to college for three months while they, they emptied the pipeline and called us to active duty. I ended up getting my basic training with the combat engineers at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Unfortunately, about that time, they were having an invasion in Africa. And the word got quickly passed around that combat engineers were cannon fodder. So immediately, everybody wanted a more promising uh, role in the service than that, so everybody tried to get out. As a result of that, I got sent to a classification center where for two weeks they had you take additional tests because they didn't know enough about you. Well, you know how that goes. <laughs> Eventually, I ended up <clears throat> getting sent back to school in New York City, CCNY, because I had been in engineering school before volunteering. That was a wonderful place to go, except it was a lousy uh, facility. It was We lived in an abandoned, uh, condemned Jewish orphanage <laughs> that had been remade for the Army. The biggest inconvenience was that all the urinals were only 12 inches off the floor. <laughs> New York's uh, location did have one advantage. There were things you could do uh, on the weekends if you kept your grades up. And one day the USO girls said, uh, here's a couple of tickets. Uh, be sure and be there at 6 o'clock. And we went to an old, dingy, off-Broadway theater that was dirty and dusty, and went in, there was nobody there. Well, we were a little early. Pretty soon a bunch of GIs came in. By the time we realized what was going on, this was the Glenn Miller Air Force Band, who were practicing out at New Haven at Yale University, but came in to New York on Saturday evenings to have a half-hour practice session and then a half-hour recording for stuff to be sent overseas. This was fantastic. I had played in a dance band in high school, and these were the best musicians in the country, I thought, and the music was unbelievable. But after a half hour's practice, they would shush everybody and brought out some huge recording consoles that were about three feet square and about four feet high. And we went up afterwards and took a look at one. It was a wire recorder. They didn't even have tape recorders yet. But those wire recordings were made and they were flown directly overseas and rebroadcast in England. Well, after that, 2 o'clock one morning, a sergeant came in the barracks and said, Get up. You're in the Air Corps now. <laughs> Your train, le train leaves for Madison, Wisconsin in two hours. Be at the front door with all your gear in one hour. Well, this was in February 1944. And you can guess what winters are like in Wisconsin. Tar paper barracks, uh, two cots wide and 100 feet long with three coal stoves in each one. And every time somebody had to put more coal in the stove, there would be a huge cloud of soot that would come out and spread all the way down the barracks. So a lot of the guys spent a lot of time in the hospital that first winter. There were uh, interesting things. I was being taught to be a radio mechanic and when I finished the course, I was kept on as an instructor. But the excitement, most excitement we had was um, the P-39s that were being ferried to Russia. They were picked up by our ferry command pilots at Niagara Falls at the Bell plant, flown to Selfridge Field, Michigan for refueling, and then to Madison. And at Madison, they would either be flown on to Edmonton by our people or would be picked up by Russian girl pilots be flown the north route to Russia. Problem with some of these ladies was they had lots of daring do. One of their favorite tricks was to have a race with each other to see who could get the wheels up fastest when they took off. Well, 
every once in a while, uh, they would not quite have flying speed when they raised the wheels. And to hear a three or a four bladed metal plop uh, pounding the pavement in the middle of the night does the same thing to your back that it used to be when the teacher had a piece of bad chalk. <laughs> well, I had a, a pretty routine job in teaching. I was teaching troubleshooting, and there wasn't a great challenge, but I learned there that some Air Force guys are pretty creative. I had, in the middle of one lecture, I could hear music, and this wasn't cricket. Um, scanned around the room and finally found there was one of the students was sitting there. He, he still had his headphones on because he'd been working at the bench with the equipment. And he had the, the plug in his mouth. I walked over close to him, and the closer I got, the louder the music got. <laughs> he had realized that he had a gold crown opposite an amalgam filling. And by touching the two of them with his plug, it acted just like a detector in a crystal set. And he was able to hear music from the college radio station at a tower about a thousand feet away. Well, it was a little, got a little routine after a while, although I did enjoy teaching. But I got a job in a defense plant in town at night. They hired two of us to be foremen on an assembly line. And it was a joint venture between the Reuben Mallory Battery Company and Railback, and they were hand fabricating the batteries that were used for the first small handy talkies that the Army had in service, by far the smallest portable radios ever. And this was a challenging job. I finally felt I was doing something for the war effort. <laughs> so that went along for a while until the pipeline was full of radio mechanics. They decided to close down the tech school. I was moved to an outfit at Scottfield, Illinois called uh, Army Airways Communication System. And we were headed for somewhere on an organization that serviced the equipment mainly in control towers and weather stations. And the Air Corps' equipment wasn't good enough for them. They had to learn how to use commercial equipment. So this involved some more schooling. Well, that was followed by a waiting period at Shepherd Field, Texas in August. and. Uh, it was so hot in Shepherd Field in August that you couldn't sleep in the barracks. The guys would sleep on a blanket out in between the barracks at night. The drawback of that was that uh, that was the Army's first helicopter training school. And those old helicopters could just barely keep themselves in the air and couldn't if there was any wind. The only time they could fly was about 4 o'clock in the morning when the air was dead calm. And they seemed to particularly enjoy coming down to about 150 feet above the barracks, giving us a cold blast to wake up with. <laughs> that led to uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, on the way to Japan. Just then, uh, the Air Corps came out with an offer that if you would re-enlist for a year, you could go to Germany instead of Japan. That sounded good to me. I'd had some ancestors from Germany, and it sounded like a better deal. So I took it. I got to Germany, and crossed the North Atlantic in March, which was a kick. Uh, got to France and down into Germany and uh, was on my way to become the uh, radio mechanic at the tower at Tempelhof in Berlin. And <laughs> the only travel from where I started out in Wiesbaden was by, quote, available transportation. Well, the only available transportation was the back end of a weapons carrier that was going cross country. They got as far as Schweinfurt the first night. We stopped for an overnight stay. The uh, CO there was a ham radio operator who looked at my records and saw something that appealed to him, so he changed my records and I never got to Berlin. And I spent the rest of the time in Schweinfurt because he was a little politic. And there were a number of P-47s that had just been bulldozed into a pile for destruction with uh, dropping thermite on them. But the radio set that I had been an instructor on was the first VHF set that we had in the Air Corps. And because at very high frequencies, the radio energy travels around the outside of a conductor instead of through the metal, uh, they were silver-plated. 
to increase the conductivity. This guy had us go through that whole pile of brand new P-47s that were ultimately to be destroyed and pull out the plate coils from all of those. And when a contingent of visiting congressmen visited two weeks later, he handed him a cardboard box full of these to show how cost conscious he was saving the taxpayers money, not letting them destruct the silver. Well, Europe in 1946, the Air Corps was not like it had been in the three previous years. When all the bombers went home, there was nothing left but the 9th Air Force and a few fighters. And along with that loss of status, there was a loss of facilities. The regular army uh, usurped Garmisch Partenkirchen for their R&R spot, which was one of the best ski resorts in the world. The Air Corps had one little lake about 50 miles south of Munich, uh, Lake Tegernsee, which had one hotel, one bar, no transportation, and an Army Nurse Corps on the edge of the lake that was off limits. <laughs> so the Air Corps was not reigning supreme at that point of, of history. Well, I drank some poison cherry brandy that had been imported from Italy, and they don't know whether it went bad or whether somebody had battened it on purpose, but it took six months in Army hospitals to get out. I finally got out long after I had been cured. I had to sign a waiver that allowed them to use a new experimental drug, which was called penicillin, and apparently it worked. But I got back, and I finally got out, went back, got married, finished school, started a family, and this was all back history. Well, history came around again in 1969. I stumbled into a, a little bookshop in a motel lobby that had a picture of about 500 Air Corps planes. And I picked it up and looked at it, and there were a lot of them that I had worked on, or worked on the radios on. And <clears throat> this was interesting because I had done some research at 3M that showed that the more hobbies a man had when he retired, the longer he would live. <laughs> well, the optimum number was four, or was five, and I had four. So I needed another hobby. And I nosed around with some buddies and I said, I wonder if anybody ever tried to get a picture of every make and model of plane ever built. And they said, nobody would be crazy enough to do that. So Hobby 5 was born. Uh, that collection today, 30-some years later, contains over a million pictures of 35,000 different makes and models of aircraft from all countries and all, all the vintages. But about halfway through, there were two kinds of aircraft pictures that I couldn't take time to sort out, so I just threw them in boxes. One was nose art. The other was home-built aircraft. Still don't care about the nose, the home-built aircraft, but the nose art took over and became hobby number one. And right now, that collection is the biggest one in the world. There are nose arts identified for about 9,000 each B-24s and B-17s. In my picture collection, there are pictures of about 4,800 B-24s and about 3,000 B-17s. I spend about eight hours a day on the internet now dealing with the children and grandchildren of flyers and air crewmen from World War II, who says, uh, Grandpa never talked much about his wartime experiences, but after he died, I found this shoebox of pictures. And some of these pictures have markings on them. Could you tell us where he was or what he did or anything about it? Well, this is my volunteerism. And I do this, and the days aren't long enough. And you can't buy many nickel beers with what it pays, but the psychic income from helping these kids find out about what their ancestors did in World War II is very gratifying. So my involvement with the Air Corps still continues in a way. Thanks.